Welcome to the Osteoarthritis Action Alliance Lunch and Learn for September 2015. My name is Kirsten Ambrose and I appreciate all of you taking the time to join our webinar today. I am pleased to introduce our presenter, Kelly Evenson. Dr. Evenson is a research professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Gilling School of Global Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on the influence of the physical environment and policies on physical activity. She is also interested in studying how physical activity changes from pregnancy through postpartum. Dr. Evenson has collaborated on or led a number of studies on physical activity intervention, measurement, and analysis, with a special focus on policies and environments that support physical activity. She's been awarded grants from several agencies, such as the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, American Heart Association, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Dr. Evenson will share some of her latest research with us today in her presentation titled, Activity Trackers, Evidence for Accuracy and Uses from Research Studies. Welcome, Dr. Evenson. Thank you so much, and thank you all for joining today. Hopefully this will be a useful uh, 30 minutes, whether you're interested in activity trackers for yourself, for your family, or for the people that you work with. And walking is also uh, a very important topic. In fact, one week ago, the Surgeon General's call to action was announced around promoting walking and walkable communities. So if you haven't heard of that, uh, do a search uh, to find that. The Surgeon General doesn't do too many of those announcements, maybe one every year or two. So we're really excited that that was done around walking. And. There we go, next slide. So I have been working for the past year part-time with uh, collaborators at RTI International, and they were interested in learning more about activity trackers to use for their research projects. And so I started reviewing the literature and it snowballed into this systematic review, which I will tell you the results of today. And as you see in the slide here, this is my definition of what an activity or fitness tracker is. It's a consumer wearable device used for monitoring fitness or physical activity related measures. It can provide feedback either via a mobile device, a base station, or a computer. And it provides long-term tracking as well as data storage. Uh, it can enable self-monitoring and it allows you to compare your information to peers. So tracking for health has definitely become more popular. This is results of a U.S. study in 2012. Actually, 69% of adults said they tracked at least one health indicator for themselves or a family member or friend. And of course, they didn't all use electronic devices. Some use paper tracking or other methods. And among those that tracked, 21% said they used technology and almost half said that that technology, that tracking, changed their overall approach to maintaining their health. It led to asking the doctor new questions or getting a second opinion, and a third of those that tracked indicated that it affected a decision that they made. So tracking can be important and useful. For the uh, systematic review that I did, I summarized the re reliability and validity of the most popular activity trackers that are on the market. And the way that I decided which trackers to focus on, uh, it, I looked at the market share and at the time the most recent numbers are in the table that you see from 2013 to 2014. And about two-thirds of the trackers sold were made by Fitbit, 18% from Jawbone and 11% from Nike. That resulted in 3.3 million trackers sold during that one year period, if you can believe it. Nike has discontinued the sale of their bands, so I only focused on Fitbit and Jawbone. And actually, in going through the literature, uh, there aren't many studies on other devices anyway, so uh, this, this seemed to be a good choice. So I focused on five components that I will tell you about. They are steps distance walked or run, physical activity, energy expenditure, and sleep. And I want to tell you just briefly about the two devices, Fitbit and Jawbone. 
Fitbit, it was actually uh, the first company in 2008 of the two that came out with activity trackers, and Jawbone came out with them in 2011. Both companies are based in San Francisco, and they both contain a triaxial accelerometer. So an accelerometer can measure acceleration at a very fine grain. In fact, it can measure it multiple times per second. And they use a proprietary algorithm to take that acceleration and convert it into steps and energy expenditure, the things that we'll talk about. But they don't let us know how that conversion takes place, unfortunately. The Fitbit and Jawbone both give information at the day level, so you get a day level summary. And with some effort, you can get minute level data with the Fitbit. So this is just to indicate how I did the literature search. Uh, it was done through June of this year, and I've still been monitoring the literature, and since then I've found four more studies that I could include. Uh, but overall, 18 were included, and all of them reported on the Fitbit. Five of them reported on the Jawbone devices. And I'll be talking about reliability. When we think about that, there could be both intra-device reliability, so within the same tracker, and there were actually no studies of that, and then inter-device reliability, does the trackers across devices give the same information? We wouldn't want to be using it for ourselves or for others if it didn't give accurate information day to day. And then validity, uh, will, that will be compared to a criterion measure that I'll talk about. So this is a, an image that we created showing the products that exist for Fitbit first, and below the line are the discontinued products. The very first one that came out was the Classic here, and that was updated with the Ultra, and now the Ultra has been updated with the One up here. And then the Force came out and was only out for a very short time, and was recalled because it, it irritated uh, many people's wrist. I will be presenting information on five devices. You might be familiar um, with the Classic, the Ultra, the One, Zip, and Flex. These newer devices here, there aren't any studies on yet. This is a graphic for the Jawbone. You can see there are fewer devices and they're all wrist-worn except this one here, which can be worn in multiple locations. The two uh, devices that I'll be talking about are the UP and the UP24. And this device here, the UP, was actually recalled because it was having trouble syncing or, and keeping a charge, so that device uh, was recalled. This device here, the orange one, was uh, is no longer sold, I noticed, this summer, and it's because they keep updating the product. This slide shows just a summary of all 18 studies, so you can see that uh, for reliability, we actually don't have any information for physical activity, and for validity, we have information across all the domains that we'll talk about, and for the jawbone specifically, we also don't have any reliability. Most studies, I have to say, were on adults. Only one was on uh, youth. Most participants had a normal body mass index, and most were middle-aged. So I'll have a slide here for each component. Uh, so the first is steps, and the reliability for the steps, the, this first line will be in each slide showing you which devices were tested and how many studies for each device. In total, there were six lab studies and one in the field, and reliability was good to excellent. So steps recorded the same way uh, between trackers. For validity, there were quite a few studies, nine in the lab and two in the field. And the uh, output from the devices was compared to either manually counting steps, so in a lab watching a person walk and counting every step they take, or it was compared to a pedometer or a, an accelerometer that measured steps as well. In, in summary, where they tested both hip and wrist, hip works better and outperforms wrist when 
looking at step counts. So if that's really important, you'd want a device that was worn at the hip. Generally, there was high agreement with cor correlations greater than 0.8, meaning that the tracker did quite a good job across the trackers, actually, both Jawbone and Fitbit for the ones that you see um, in measuring steps. And I have to say, going into this project, I did not think they would do as well as they did, and the literature proved me wrong. One thing to know, though, is that they might underestimate steps at a higher speed. So if someone is running, steps could be underestimated. So the second component I looked at was distance. Was the distance estimated from the tracker reliable and accurate? There was only one study. They looked at both reliability and validity. Reliability was excellent, and for validity, they found that uh, at slower speeds, the distance was overestimated, and at faster speeds, the distance was underestimated. And this was using the Fitbit One device. So not a lot of information there. For physical activity, there were no studies, as I mentioned, on reliability. For validity, uh, the criterion measure that was compared was from an ex another accelerometer. So I mentioned that the devices have an accelerometer, it was compared to other accelerometers that we've tested in the lab and know that they're quite good. Uh, unfortunately, the trackers tended to overestimate moderate to vigorous physical activity. There was a wide range of correlations uh, as presented on the slide. The next component was an estimate of energy expenditure, or some of the devices call it kcals burned. The reliability was quite high from the six lab studies and one field-based study. The validity, uh, the criterion measure that was used was either whole room calorimetry, an accelerometer, or a questionnaire. And generally, trackers underestimated energy expenditure. And again, there was a wide correlation. Uh, some studies showed higher agreement than others. And then the last component that we looked at was sleep. And in terms of reliability, uh, there's just been a little bit of work on that, and the devices do seem reliable for measuring sleep, but the validity was not very good, unfortunately. All of the, the three studies compared to a criterion measure of PSG, polysomnography, which is quite a good measure, and uh, the sleep was overestimated, total sleep time was overestimated, and as was sleep efficiency, when the tracker was in normal mode. One of the studies had a tracker that could be set to sensitive mode, and when that was done, it actually underestimated total sleep time and sleep efficiency. So in summary, from the 18 studies, there was no tracker that had a complete assessment across all five measures. So my generalizations need to take that into account. But in terms of reliability, it was excellent for steps, energy expenditure, and sleep for the Fitbit trackers. We don't really know. There haven't been any studies on the jawbone for that. In terms of validity for steps, it's quite good, particularly in the lab but it's lower for energy expenditure and sleep, and there really hasn't been too many studies on distance and physical activity. So when I went through these papers and read and read from the websites for Fitbit and Jawbone, I realized there were some things that could be done by the user to make the trackers more accurate. And in fact, many of these studies didn't even indicate that they did some of these things, and their results may have been better had they done this. So I summarize the list here. So first of all, if it's you or clients you work with wearing the trackers, make sure to wear them in the same position every day and to enter and update your personal characteristics. So when you first set up the device, you need to enter things like height, weight, gender, age. If someone is losing weight, it would be a good idea to go in and update that information. For the wrist-worn trackers, uh, usually they ask to indicate if you're wearing it on your dominant or non-dominant wrist, 
and it's actually better to wear it on your non-dominant wrist, uh, both for the jawbone and the Fitbit. And that's because you have extra movement in your dominant wrist. For walking, uh, both devices, you can calibrate the stride length that you take, and that will help you better estimate distance. It should improve when you enter in that information. And as the devices update, they're, they add add-on features, and it may be that by keeping accurate, the device will be more accurate. There's also usually, in, in the newer devices, a diary or journal function. So for example, you can tell it what type of activity you're doing. And it may be that the tracker will improve estimation when you do that. It's not clear if it will or not, but it may. And then finally, if you use the sleep mode functions, there are ways to interact with it to tell it when you're taking a nap or actually going to sleep. And by interacting, it may improve. And I say it may, the companies don't tell us how they derive these things, but I feel certain they're using something called machine learning, which is a statistical technique. And so it can learn better when you give it this information. So from the 18 studies that I went through, one thing that I think is very important is feasibility. And this is something you'll want to think about with the people that you work with. And so I went back through the studies. There were seven that reported on missing data. And I thought this would be important to share with you. So in the lab data, in the lab studies listed on the left there, uh, several of them had quite a bit of missing data, sometimes due to the device being set up improperly. For one study in the sleep lab, they had 10 people missing data uh, just because of the way the device was set up. And uh, also, two people had corrupted uh, polysonography files. But just to be aware that uh, there could be errors in setup, so you'll want to check and make sure it's working. And then in the field-based studies, they, in one study they sent people home to wear the device for two days. And when the 21 participants came back, a third of them were missing the information. Uh, so the trackers can malfunction, and it can also be a user malfunction. And finally, in another study, the trackers were worn for 10 days, and this was among a group of 60-year-olds and older. And they also had a third missing uh, when they came back after 10 days. Two had lost the tracker, and three had not uh, plugged the device in for it to transmit. And finally, uh, what I want to leave you with is just a list of a couple papers I found for interventions. And I've listed them by adults and youth. And I'm just going to briefly mention uh, a sentence or two on each one in case you're interested in going out and getting the articles. So the earliest article by Curdy in 2013 was among 12 sedentary adults. They had uh, the participants wear a Fitbit and did two experiments with incentives, monetary incentives, and they did show that walking increased. The study by Washington had 11 participants wear a Fitbit for three weeks. They gave prizes to them for wearing the device, and they found that four of the 11 participants did increase their step counts in the short term. The two other studies I list are probably the better quality studies. So the study by Thompson had uh, 49 participants, 65 to 95 years of age. They were sedentary or overweight. And they allocated people into two different groups. One group received a Fitbit and counseling. And then 24 weeks later, just had the Fitbit. And the other group didn't receive anything the first 24 weeks, and then later received uh, the Fitbit and counseling. They actually did not find significant improvements uh, in terms of physical activity with their participants wearing the Fitbit for that long of a period. And then the final study in American Journal of Preventive Medicine was 51 women overweight, and they were randomized to a 16-week web-based monitoring program, and they were given a Fitbit to wear. And that was compared to a group that only received a pedometer. 
and they were asked to do at least 150 minutes of physical activity per week, um, at least moderate intensity, which is the physical activity recommendations. And they found, different from the Thompson study, that there was a significant improvement in uh, uh, physical activity. 62 minutes for the intervention group, 13 minutes for the control. And, and actually, I correct myself, I don't think it reached significance, uh, but that getting an hour more per week uh, due to the intervention, that's, that's a significant finding, maybe not statistical significance. My last slide here is just to remind you that these trackers uh, pose a challenge in that how do we keep people engaged over time? And this is a, a figure I found from Google Trends, which is a, a fun place to go and search on topic areas to see what people are entering in Google and searching on. And the waves that you see here are search terms related to fitness, diet, health, yoga, gym. And you can see it peaks at the new year, every new year. This hasn't changed. <laughs> and it drops and then peaks back again every January. So our challenge is to help people maintain the interest and maintain the walking, uh, not just in January. So with that, I'll stop and, and hopefully answer some questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Evenson. Uh, we will now have a short Q&A for our listeners. And if you have any questions, remember to text your question to me or press the hand raise icon on your control panel. Um, very interesting findings, especially with the rise in usage of, of trackers like this. I think it's good to know not only how well they work, but also what we can do to improve how well they work. Some of the tips right. that you provided. Yep. So, um, one question has come in. We have from Ted Vicky. Do the studies that you reviewed uh, suggest that a step of a Fitbit is equal to a step in a jawbone, for example, such that a wellness program could use either the Fitbit or the jawbone and be competent in the total step count that their um, clients are getting? Yes, the answer is yes. The steps were excellent in terms of measurement validity and reliability for both devices. So you could use either one. And from Barbara Moore, she said, very nice talk and very clear. Do you have anything to say about price for either device? Ah, good question. I have, I have that written down here. Uh, so for the Fitbit products, let me go back to the slide. I'll try to circle it here. So the, the charge is $130. The charge HR, so it has a heart rate, is $150. And then the surge here is $250. The uh, something cheaper, the zip here, where you can put it in your pocket or clip it on your collar or bra, that is about $50. And then for the jawbone, uh, this is sort of the equivalent. It's about $50 for the move. And then for the wrist worn, uh, the up two is 100 and the up four is about $200. And I'm guessing that the variation in price is more due to functionality as opposed to quality of the steps that, you know, all, all of the bells and whistles that you might get with one of them. That's right. If steps is your interest, you could go with the cheap device. Uh, the newer devices coming out actually have uh, GPS, heart rate, uh, they uh, have skin sensitivity, so temperature. So they're coming out with some other neat features. But if you're just interested in steps, then going with the cheapest is OK. And how about that even compared to a regular old pedometer, if you really uh, wanted to? Yeah, uh, well, pedometers still work too, and I sort of mentioned what I thought coming in. I didn't think these devices would do as well as a pedometer in counting steps. And in there were maybe two studies that actually compared directly to a pedometer. And these devices even did a little better. OK, well, that's good to know. Um, we have another question. 
Thank you for the excellent presentation from Linda Lee. Have you come across any studies that look at how well these trackers um, differentiate light activities versus sedentary behaviors? Uh, no, I have not. And in fact, the trackers, uh, I know, for example, the Fitbit just gives what's called active minutes. And so when looking at the validity, the studies looked at moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, as equivalent of the two. So I don't believe the trackers provide that at this time. I could be wrong. And definitely I didn't see any studies uh, that looked at that. Okay, and then we had from Elaine Jackson whether, uh, will this presentation be available electronically to webinar participants? And you and I have discussed this. This um, data that you've presented is pretty hot off, almost hot off the presses. It's going to um, manuscript and publication soon. We hope it's under review. So uh, we will hold presentation or um, publication of this presentation broadly until the um, paper that has all of this data is published. So as soon as we know that, which will hopefully be before the end of the year, we can provide this um, webinar presentation at that time as well as the uh, citation to the paper. That's right. And I, I apologize for that inconvenience, uh, but I did ask my co-authors and that's what they preferred. Okay, and then another question. In reviewing researchers' methods during your systematic review, did researchers access participants' personal web-based account of daily, weekly, or monthly summaries for accessing and monitoring data? For the intervention studies, they did, yes. But for the validity reliability, they often weren't, uh, they would have accessed it if they were doing uh, a field-based study because those studies lasted for days or weeks, but in the lab they were only collecting what was going on right there in the lab. Okay, and then um, the Wendy Katzman indicates that they track for seven days, but know that three days is considered accurate. Can they take the highest three days when calculating steps per week? Uh, so I think that remark might come from accelerometry, where it has been shown that three or four days of wearing the accelerometer usually represents a week, and a week is generally what we measure for studies. Uh, you know, I have not seen for these devices, a similar type study where we see how much uh, physical activity or steps fluctuates day to day and week to week, but it could certainly be looked at. So uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I hope I interpreted your question correctly. Okay, so um, if anyone has any last questions, they, you can certainly type them and um, send them to me now or raise your hand. In the meantime, let me just give you a quick announcement for our next month webinar on October 21st. That will be with Dr. Baja Belza from the University of Washington School of Nursing. She'll be speaking to us on mall walking programs, which is also very timely. Um, Dr. Evenson mentioned at the beginning of today's presentation the Surgeon General's call to action to promote walking and walkable communities. Dr. Belza has also contributed some um, companion information to that call to action regarding mall walking programs. So just uh, stay tuned for that on the 21st of next month. Um, at this point, no more questions. So I just want to take a moment to once again, thank you very much, Dr. Evenson. Very interesting, especially for some of our um, listeners who work daily with patients and, and want to encourage them to be more active. And this is one way that, you know, some people really enjoy gadgets or a visual of, of their progress. So I think this is good information. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think there are some people you don't even think might benefit. Uh, for example, my mom was given one and, I, you know, I would have never thought to give my mom one and yet she's using it and tracking her steps. So yes, I encourage you in your work. Very good. Thank you so much. Thanks thank for joining. Mm -hmm. And thank you everyone for joining us today. That takes uh, that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much.